32. Wow. As I pondered and thought about the message, and God changes it a lot throughout the week. It even changes passages and everything else. But Psalm 32 is a psalm that's written by David. In a time in his life when he still hadn't acknowledged or dealt with the issue that he had had with Bathsheba, he was still running from God, trying to do things in plan B or plan C. It's better to go with plan A. And plan A is God's way. When God's agenda is our agenda, that's the best way to have it. And if you talk to David when you get to heaven, he'd probably tell you that the greatest days and enjoyment of his life was when he was following the Lord's guide. When he was doing his own thing, not so good. And doing your own thing is, leads to devastation, discouragement, dryness, and emptiness within consequences that you don't necessarily want. And he would share that, but in all those things, he would say that the drawing of God back to himself is what it's all about. And wherever you are, if you are in plan A, praise God and keep going. If you are in plan B, get back to plan A, because that plan B will leave you discouraged and defeated and doing your own thing and ignoring what God has for you and the opportunities he's placed for you. Wherever you are in those dynamics, you need to get to back where the joyful life is. In Psalms 116, it says, In your presence is fullness of joy. And if I thought of plan A this morning, I thought, what is really plan A? First thing is plan A is where you can have atonement for your sin. You have it forgiven. Another part of plan A is that abundant life that he wants us to have from John chapter 10. I have come to give them life and that they might have life more abundantly. He wants you to enjoy the abundant life. God created us in his image so that we could reflect the glory back to the Father. And that's the only way we can do it is as redeemed children to enjoy that abundant life. And then I think of John 15 where he tells us to abide in him. To feel at home in the presence of Christ. When you're running from God, you're not feeling at home in his presence. In fact, when you're doing your own thing, you don't even want to hear much about God. You're not praying. You're not reading the Bible. You find it a struggle to bring yourself to church. You're like, oh no, he's going to go at it again. And the word's going to convict me and all that kind of stuff. And the excuses mount and you just do your own thing. But that's what happens when we get out of his plan. And David is penning this psalm, and interesting enough, he states what it's like to have it where you need to be, where he is, and finally he gets, says, okay, I'm going to make it right. And that's what happens in the psalm, and we'll read it together and look at it for a few moments. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, though through my groaning all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. As you look at that psalm, you see the dynamics changing from where he wants to be, where he is, to where he ends up. And it all depends on your open heart honesty with God, your willingness to confess your sin, and turn from the ways that are not pleasing to him. But as we look at the psalm, 
and he penned it during that time he wouldn't confess his sin with Bathsheba. And it took that confrontation from Nathan to get him to acknowledge that he was the one that caused the havoc and the, the destruction within his own household. And it was his sin that caused the heavens to be as brass. And the Psalm 53 is a better chapter of his confession to God and how that he cries out for the joy of his salvation. Remember the day that you trusted the Lord as your Savior and the joy that accompanied that, whether you felt a release from guilt and sin and grief and that, but that joy is unexplainable. And a joy that comes along with that is when you have the privilege to show someone else the way of eternal life and they receive Christ. That's a great joy. And you can also remember the times of frustration and silence and weariness that he expresses in verses 3 and 4 of whenever we're not right with God. And we know when that is. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit of God within us who convicts us of sin. Whenever there's an issue in our life, he's really good at bringing that up. And he brings that to your mind and he wants you to deal with that. When the Holy Spirit of God works in your heart about an issue, whatever it is, he knows you like you don't know yourself. He knows your thoughts, he knows your intents, he knows your desires, and he, because he's God. And when he brings it to our attention, he wants us to respond in obedience. That is going to come in a few moments as I look at an obedience factor. But the desired place is that place of contentment. David acknowledges in the first two verses that the guy who is right with God is blessed. Do you know what? If, if you're right with God and you're where he wants you to be, it really doesn't matter what the rest of the world's doing. And it really doesn't matter about the circumstances because he is able, he still is God, and he's still with us. And as his child and treasure, he will take care of you. There is a contentment in the peace of God that passes all understanding. And you know and I know when we're in that arena. We know that our sin has been taken care of at Calvary. That is a wonderful thing. We sang about that, that our, his wrath was satisfied. Whenever he paid the price and you received that forgiveness, the penalty of your sin is eliminated. You're not going to get penalties for later down the road. Oh, by the way, I missed this one, so here's your penalty. No, he forgave it all at Calvary. You know what's so amazing? He forgave the sin that you haven't even committed yet because he takes care of that. And he doesn't want you to do that. That's when we fall into plan B, but we ought to desire to follow his plan. So our sin is taken care of. The grace and the mercy is abounding. There is an enjoyment in life not only is there contentment, there is a, you know, he mentions the conviction that he had. He wishes that he could experience that blessed life. Is it possible for every believer to experience a blessed life by God? Yes, it is possible. He has given us everything we need for that. He has given us everything that pertains to godliness. So as you see this contentment, he, he desires to be there, but that's not his portion. And if you ever get convicted when you do wrong, or even before you do wrong, you should rejoice, because that is indicating you are a child of God, that you have a conviction within your heart, that he is steering you away from that wrongdoing. And it's just natural for an unbeliever to do wrong things. But if for a believer, you've got the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He can preserve your life from destruction. If you follow his lead, you can walk in paths of righteousness. And I encourage you to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, whatever that is. And you can always know that it's going to be consistent with His Word. He'll never lead you into a temptation that's evil. God cannot tempt man with evil. We're told that in the book of James. So the, the conviction is real to David. Then he decides that, that because he desires to be there, and he's miserable. You and I know how miserable it can be when we ignore doing what God wants us to do. It is just a gnawing within. It, that's what I experience. I don't know what you experience, but you just seems like you lose your joy, you lose your smile, you lose your enthusiasm. It's just like not good. It's like a rainy day parade or something. It's like no sunshine for weeks or whatever. That's just about what it feels like. David is experiencing it as the drought of summer, a parchness, a dryness, a heavy hand upon him, verse 4. 
and his groaning all the day long, and at night he's not sleeping. Those kinds of things that torment your mind whenever you're not doing what is right. We don't have to live in that place. You're only a prayer away from restoration. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You're only one prayer, one step to having things cleared up and put back in the desired place. The desired place, then secondly, is the divine pardon. And you see that in verse 5, that he has forgiven all his iniquity. And he had not, he, he, in verse, the last part of 5, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And he confessed it all to God. So the absolute pardon is there. He acknowledged his failure and his sin. He was honest with God. I have not hidden anything from him, is what he said. And he confesses. When you get to being honest with God, you quit being general. Well, God, forgive me for where I might have failed. No, you know where you failed. You know where you disobeyed. I never had to question where I disobeyed my parents. I knew exactly what I had done. When you're called to the principal's office and you rarely have to be told what you might have done, you knew what you did. And when God calls you to the conviction through the Holy Spirit, you know exactly what you did. When you let that profanity out, when you told that lie, when you took that thing that wasn't yours, when you were unkind to your spouse, when you, whatever you did that was a transgression against God, you knew what you did. It's a matter of acknowledging it. When God went down in the Garden of Eden, do you think Adam and Eve were questioning, wondered what we did that we're hiding behind these bushes? No, they knew what they did. They disobeyed God. And what do you think, do you think that they thought they would surprise him? You know, but, but he knows. You, you're not going to surprise God by telling him what you did because he already knows. Confess it to him. And it's, that, that confession will, might help you to avoid that same transgression the next time. When you confess, God, I lied to so-and-so and I am sorry for that. Please forgive me. Or I did whatever, confess it, you're going to Say, I'm tired of owning this stuff. I'm going to change my ways. That's part of repentance. So you have the acknowledgement. You have the honesty, the confession. And whenever we confess, does God always hear our prayer? Yes. He doesn't put you on pause, say, hi, uh -uh, you've been here three times today. I'm not going to hear you again. Or you came way too many times last month. You have expired your entrance. No. You can go to him day or night, anytime and have that restored. I encourage you that it should be less and less the more you mature in Christ. If you have to constantly be going to him for failure and sin, then you need to get some more nutrition from his word and allow his word to transform your life because it does that. The word of God is what cleanses us. It is what allows us to become clean vessels as we apply its principles and obey its instructions. So the answered prayer is there, the abundant protection that he's experiencing after he confesses this sin and gets things right with God, he experiences this protection. It says that the flood of waters will not come upon him. I like verse 7. You are my hiding place. I think of a bomb shelter. Remember going in buildings and they'd put that sign up, this is a bomb shelter. Apparently it's structurally sound enough to withstand tremors or whatever that is, but those that you keep in your mind think, well, if there's ever a bad situation, I'm going to run there. I'm going to find protection. There's only been a few times on our hillside that I have went to the basement on purpose to avoid being blown off of the hill. When you hear the wind coming over the hall like a freight train, and you know it's not a freight train, you better use your noggin. You know? And if you don't want to do that, fine. Blow away with the siding up into the weeds if that's what you care to do. But there are times when you seek a protection and the best place of that is with Him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. We have no idea how much trouble God has preserved us from. Some of that He shows us. Some of it He doesn't. Have you ever redirect your path to go a different direction and you went? He might have preserved you from hours of frustration. He might have caused that breaker to go so your house didn't burn down. Or he might have caused that flat tire to keep you out of an accident. 
You don't know what he has done, but he is a God that will preserve you. He promises that. And you can trust him. So don't get the bad attitude out of the hole when something doesn't necessarily go right. Because it could be a divine intervention in preserving you from bigger problems. When that child spills the drink on the floor and you have to clean it up and it holds you back. Or You read the accounts from the, th the events that took place on September 11th, how the people were spared from death because they missed a bus or because they had to take a kid to school or whatever the situation was that God preserved them from simple things that happen in life. He is our place of protection from the elements. He mentions the flood of waters from their enemies. You are my hiding place. We need to, as we are lifting up the Ukrainians, they need protection from God. From the emotional stuff, preserve me from trouble with songs of deliverance. Do you ever get in a situation and you break out in the song? It's rare, but you might as well be enjoying it as miserable the whole journey. You know, this is how it is, you know, and take it with happiness. I thought of this as the first surround sound ever. Surround me with songs of deliverance. Back in college, I think, is when they introduced surround sound. I introduced a lot of things since then. That was in the 80s, and I was sitting watching Home Alone whenever, with surround sound, and when the kid locked the door, I looked behind me because I thought someone was behind me. It was just surround sound. It made you feel like you're in that arena. When we were growing up, we went to amusement park, Kennywood, on an annual basis, and they had this theater you would go into, and it made it look like you were riding a roller coaster and flying an airplane and all this stuff. It was the whole way around the room. I literally fell off of the seat because I thought the airplane <laughs> dumped me. I'm not kidding you. That's just how real it seemed. But in these times of scariness and troubles, God is there, and he is real. And you can sense his presence, and he can give you that peace that passes all understanding. The last thing is the direction that he provides. And that is in verse, look at verse 8. Who took charge of teaching us? The Lord. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Do you see the difference between instruct and teach? You get instructions with your product that you purchase. If you're going to teach me, you're going to show me. And he, God shows us how to live. You follow the life of Jesus and you will know the Father. He showed us how to handle situations. He showed us how to treat others. He showed us how to be relaxed in stressful situations. He showed us all the dynamics of life. Not only did he instruct us and he will teach us, he will guide us with his eye, oversee it. Aren't you glad about that? When he says, hey, don't do that. That's the Holy Spirit of God. It's, why do you tell your child, don't touch that hot stove? Because you're trying to preserve them from pain. When the Holy Spirit of God says, do this or don't do that, he's trying to help you and guide you. So be glad the fact that he took that duty upon himself, that he would instruct us and teach us and guide us. That's his part. What is our part? Obey. You see that? Don't be like the horse or the mule. What is their tendency? Stubborn. No. I want to do my own thing. Why do they do put the bit in its mouth? And why do they make to put the carrot in front of the mule? And why do they do the things they do? Because they are obstinate. And they need to be controlled. And they need to be under submission and willing to obey. That changes the whole dynamics. I listened to some dude preaching this week on the radio and he illustrated, and it goes right with the message, from 1984 movie, Karate Kid. Mr. Miyagi made a deal with the boy. I don't remember the boy's name if he even had a name. But it said he made a deal with him. He wanted Mr. Miyagi to do what? Teach him karate. All right? He said, and however he said it, Miyagi teach you. You, what was the boy's instructions? To obey. I do, you obey. I say, you do, is what it, how it was worded. I say, you do. And he got a great assignment for the first thing, right? 
No, you're going to wash and wax all these vehicles. You wash them, then you wax them. You put it on with your left hand, you take it off with the right, whatever, however it was. Is, yes, wax on, wax off. You're going to do this the way I say you're going to do it. This was the illustration. And he went on and on and on further than I need to go on and on and on. He went from painting the fence to sanding the floor to, oh, I don't need to hear all that because I can't even remember movies. That's one of the three movies I ever watched in my life, probably. But Karate Kid was, they made a deal. I will teach you karate, but this is your part. I say you do. What happens throughout the scripture? That's God's part. He will instruct, he will teach, and he will guide. I say, the Lord, you do. If you do his will and his way, what's going to happen? Success, bingo, an abundant life. What are we afraid to say that for? Because we want to experience it, but sometimes we hesitate on the simple instructions to tell that neighbor, write that card, give that phone call, read that scripture, pray for so-and-so. Those simple things that teach us bigger dynamics. If you don't pray and be accountable for little things, you're not going to be involved in the big things. That's what the scripture says. There's nothing insignificant in God's program. It might be helping that child tie his shoe. It might be giving that word of encouragement. It might be just that handshake or the whatever it takes to help someone along the way. Do what he wants you to do. The instruction is his. The illustration of the mule is our tendency to do our own thing and think we know better, but it will not lead to pleasant places. So as he alluded to the illustration, the mule and the horse, they have no understanding. They must be harnessed with a bit and a bridle. They are elusive and stubborn. They need to be broken, is the term. Do you know God still has to do that when we're too rebellious? He has to break us to allow us to be submissive to him. Don't wait till it has to be harsh. Listen to the still small voice. Respond in obedience quickly and you'll experience a blessed life. So as the insight is given in the last two verses, there are three things mentioned and I'm done. Many sorrows are for the wicked. A lot of self-inflicted trouble comes that direction. Mercy surrounds those that trust the Lord. Aren't you glad that he is abundant in mercy? Aren't you glad that he is, understands that we are dust and we fail and we need him to guide us and to show us and to instruct us? I'm not the brightest tool, light in the shed or the tool, sharpest tool in the box, but he has to constantly be working with me. And you know what? He's working with you if you allow him to do that. Some people get it easily. Some people need a little more patience, and he's willing to do that. So don't give up. Stay with it, and you can have the last part of the verse. You can be glad and rejoice and shout for joy. When's the last time you let it out? Praise the Lord, or thank you, God, or this is great, Father. I appreciate it. Just praising him for his blessing and bestowment upon you. Plan A is the place to be. If you are not with plan A, get with it, because you're not going to experience the best life till you do. Father, thank you for your word, for the instruction that it gives. Thank you, Father, that you sent us a teacher to show us the way. His name was Jesus. And thank you, God, that you guide us with the Holy Spirit. And that you keep us on paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Thank you, Father, for the encouragement we get from your word, for the opportunities that you place before us. Help us to be found faithful as you are. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>